This is the second to last leg of my first trip to Roma and southern Italy. I'll go to Santa Maria Maggiore, St. Mary Major, one of the four major basilicas of the Catholic Church, then to a very special church, San Clemente, and on to the Jesuit church of the glorious Counter-Reformation, and finally to a place you can only see here on my DVD as it is closed now. To be in Roma and not visit the major churches is a crime and a sin. Santa Maria Maggiore, one of the five major basilicas, gives us a glimpse into Roma's glorious artistic legacy. Founded in 350 by Pope Liberius, it was built atop the Esquiline Hill because of a miracle. More about that later. The front and rear facades and the two domes are Baroque, the bell tower Romanesque. Its most famous feature is its Roman-style mosaics of the 5th century. This is one of the four basilicas uh, of Rome, built during the early period of Christian religion. And it's also the first church dedicated to Mary. Uh, the foundation of the, of the church is dated back to the first half of the 5th century AD. Uh, exactly when Mary was proclaimed the mother of Jesus. This happened officially in 431 during one of the first councils of the history of the church, the Council of Ephesus. The wonderfully gilded coffered ceiling by San Gallo is from gold from the New World given by King and Queen Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain. And it is a typical early Christian basilica. The shape of it is very, very simple. It is rectangular, divided into naves. The central one is larger than the other ones and is separated by columns. The columns uh, dividing the naves are original Roman columns made with marble. And, uh, uh, and also along the central nave you see the mosaics. Those are the most ancient mosaics existing in Rome uh, and they are dated back to uh, the 5th century. AD. They are concerning episodes taken from uh, the Old and the New Testament. We all think of mosaics as tiny rectangular colored tiles. Well, these are Venetian mosaics. While the Florentine are very large seamless pieces made of semi-precious stones, Roman style is like Petit point. For you Americans, it's like Zuni style squash blossom necklaces. And they have still maintained the style of the ancient Roman mosaics. This church is so important because it has still preserved the original shape despite of the for example, the ceiling, which has been uh, completely redone um, at the beginning of 1500. And uh, despite also uh, the canopy, which is now uh, surrounding the main altar. The high altar with its baldacchino by Fernando Fuga is reserved for the Pope alone. Now let's take a look at the back wall with its huge mosaic. So that is uh, the holy book of the Bible. And uh, at the very bottom of the throne, you, s you can see, you may see, there are two uh, globes. One is uh, uh, silver, the other is gold. That, that one is the moon and the other is the sun with all the stars about, around. So the symbol is uh, that Jesus and uh, his mother are uh, ruling the universe, so they are uh, uh, really the uh, king and the queen of, uh, the, uh, of the heaven. Uh, around the, the coronation are the angels uh, with colorful wings and then there are standing figures um, and uh, you may see there are uh, different eyes. Um, the tallest figures um, are the saints, like for example 
St. Francis and uh, St. John's Evangelist, St. Anthony, and then on the other side is St. Peter, St. Paul, St. John the Baptist, and the smallest uh, tiny uh, figures knelt in front of the saints are the uh, Pope, one is the Pope and the other is a, a, a bishop. So they were uh, portrayed when they were still alive, so they are not so important as the saints are. So they are, um, I mean, uh, uh, portrayed like small figures. And, uh, but uh, they were uh, portrayed because they were uh, strictly involved in the construction of the church. So, and in particular, they were involved uh, in uh, the mosaic work because they commissioned this work. Um, if we look at the bottom of the apse, at the very center, in between the two um, windows, you see the uh, scene of the death, uh, death of Mary. Mary is lying. Oh, yeah. Yes. Above the yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So Mary is laying down on a bed, surrounded by all the apostles, mourning for uh, her death, and uh, uh, standing behind uh, the body of Mary is uh, Jesus, holding a little baby in, her, in his arms. So the baby is uh, symbolizing the soul of Mary. The soul came out of her body and uh, the soul is uh, uh, taken by Jesus and is uh, brought up to the sky. Um, in a way, uh, the death, death of Mary um, in the Christian religion is not called the death of Mary, but it's called uh, uh, the Mary sleeping because it's not really uh, the end of the life, but it's the beginning of uh, another life, which is uh, the real life beyond the death. So uh, Christians used to uh, call the death just uh, a passageway. So it was uh, uh, the um, the sleeping uh, passageway. <laughs> but you must remember, of course, this was before the uh, proclamation of the Assumption. Yes, yes. This is be before. Long yes, before. yes, yes. It's before. On the right and left of the nave, and forming the left and right transept, are two enormous chapels, so big that you could think of them as churches in and of themselves. The first one you'll see was designed by Domenico Fontana and started in 1585. Um, so the, this chapel where we are is uh, uh, the chapel dedicated to uh, Sixtus V, uh, Pope Sixtus V, that and that is his picture, his portrait, and there is here also his tomb. So, not all the popes uh, have been buried in St. Peter's Basilica. Only uh, 148 popes are buried there. And uh, as you see here, there are a few of them which have been buried in uh, this basilica. In particular, here is uh, uh, Sixtus V, a pope who died at the very end of 1500. He was uh, very well known because in uh, only uh, five years of his papacy, he took care of the obelisks, uh, the Roman obelisks uh, here in Rome, which uh, were uh, the majority of them were uh, cracked or uh, buried under the soil. So he um, in, he uh, paid artists, architects, um, to pull the obelisk up. And, uh, for example, the obelisk standing in front of St. Peter's Basilica uh, was uh, erected under this Pope. So was also the obelisk standing uh, in front of St. John in Lateran. Uh, the other tomb you see, exactly at the opposite side, uh, is the tomb of another Pope, Pius V. Um, so Pius V, 
um, is uh, in this, this church uh, together with uh, Sixtus V because uh, he named uh, um, Pope Sixtus uh, Cardinal. So, uh, so he is reminded as the Pope who uh, gave the cardinalship to uh, the, uh, the man who became Pope with the name of Sixtus V. Um, so here is uh, what uh, is uh, left of his body. Um, the face is covered with a funerary silver mask. And uh, uh, the reason why he is uh, exposed, uh, as uh, you see now, is because he uh, uh, has been canonized, so he's a saint. So any uh, time um, uh, is uh, done a new saint, the body is removed from the tomb and is exposed, um, like is here. And um, so this chapel is hyper ornated. If you look uh, above, uh, this dome is painted with frescoes. Uh, at the bottom of the dome are frescoes painted by um, the Guido Reni, the painter Guido Reni. And, uh, uh, and then there are uh, um, marble facing the, the wall. Um, there is a curiosity, the marble you see here is a recycled marble coming from pagan ancient buildings. In the center of this church, really chapel, is the high altar of the Blessed Sacrament, dating from 1599. It is, in point of fact, a miniature representation of the chapel itself, and it is supported by four angels, one on each corner. So, in this chapel, we are f uh, we find uh, the statue representing uh, Pope Clement the uh, Eighth, and facing this monument is the tomb of Paul the Fifth. Paul V Borghese of this uh, powerful uh, family um, was, uh, he was uh, elected Pope uh, in uh, 1605 and uh, uh, this Pope was uh, really ruling the city um, also through his nephew, the favorite nephew who was named Cardinal, Scipione Borghese, was a, a very good art collector, but was also, uh, let's say, the lieutenant tenant of the Pope. Uh, so this uh, uh, chapel is uh, again hyper ornated. Mm, and uh, the reliefs you see here uh, on top of the uh, funerary monument of Pope Paul V uh, were done by uh, Gian Lorenzo Bernini's father, Pietro Bernini. Probably mm, mm, uh, is not so known as his son, but he was a very talented sculptor and he, he worked hard mm, at the end of uh, 1500 and uh, the beginning of the next century here in this church. Um, so that's why his son, Gian Lorenzo, was uh, uh, introduced so in a very early age to uh, the sculpture. So the altar of, uh, of this chapel is really precious. Um, the base of the altar is done with lapis and gold. The icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary is at least a thousand years old. It's called the Salus Populi Romani. For you Episcopalians who bear Latin, it means the well-being of the Roman people. Pope Gregory carried it through the streets in 593 while Rome suffered the plague. On his way back from St. Peter's, he saw St. Michael the Archangel above the mausoleum of Hadrian, now St. Michael the Archangel's castle because of his vision. The Archangel drew his sword, warding off the plague. Above the icon of the Blessed Virgin Mary is a bas-relief in gold to commemorate the reason this basilica was built where it is. In 395, Pope Liberius had a vision in which the Blessed Virgin Mary told him to build a church in her honor. She indicated a precise spot marking it with snow. 
The next day, the Pope found this spot atop the Esquiline Hill. It was August the 5th. So another name for this basilica is Our Lady of the Snow. What's close to the Colosseum, yet hidden from plain sight, hidden behind an 18th century facade and surrounding an arcade with 12th century columns? Why, it's one of Roma's most fascinating churches. The church where we are going to now is one of the most unique churches in Rome. And uh, the reason why is because it stands on other two underground levels, which uh, at the moment are buried. Uh, and uh, you won't see it from here. You have to descend uh, down, uh, reaching the level of 60 feet um, and below the street level to see the ground level of a Roman house dated back to the first century AD and on top of that another level dated back to the fourth century corresponding to an early Christian church dedicated to Saint Clement. So the facade of the church, now you see in front of you, uh, it, has, it has been completely reconstructed uh, in 1711, so it's a, a recent, relatively recent <laughs> facade. Um, and it's surrounded by a portico around, which is leading to the convent over there, where uh, the Irish Dominican uh, fathers are living. So the church is uh, um, uh, connected to this uh, convent. In this church is uh, one of the most beautiful mosaics existing in Roman churches in Rome. Starting from the bottom of it, you see the lamps. Lamps that are 12, six on the right, six on the left. And at the center uh, is the mystic lamb with a halo around its, uh, uh, its, uh, its uh, yes, is, is the, you no, know, is Christ, is Jesus, uh, the mystic lamb, while the 12 lambs are the 12 apostles. So it is a very simple way to show uh, figures uh, taken from the holy book of the New Testament. Um, the reason why during the Middle Age many symbols were uh, represented is because most of the people were illiterate. So uh, the church used to communicate um, the also very important concepts through symbols. Uh, like the lamb for uh, the faith uh, or uh, other animals uh, you see at the bottom of the cross. Uh, at the very center of the mosaic uh, you see there is uh, the crucifixion, uh, the holy cross uh, representing the death of Jesus. But uh, at the very bottom of the cross uh, there is a big plant growing that is the tree of life and is symbolizing the spiritual life beyond the death. At the bottom of this uh, big plant, there are animals moving. Like, for example, there is a couple of deers drinking at the four streams flowing um, at the bottom of the cross. The deers are representing uh, again Jesus, eternal life. Um, in fact, according to tradition, it was said that the deer uh, was killing uh, the uh, snake with its, its powerful breath. So the deer is the symbol of Jesus killing, defeating the evilness, the devil. And then there are also peacocks. You can see there are peacocks with long uh, wings and um, with long tails. Uh, the peacock was another symbol for eternal life. 
and which you see also in the catacombs. In the catacombs, exactly. Peacocks were uh, uh, depicted everywhere in catacombs because it was said that the flesh of this bird was uh, always good, never corrupted, and in this way was um, was seen as the eternal life given by Jesus through his sacrifice. So the meaning of this crucifixion is exactly the life given to all the people uh, through the sacrifice of Jesus. This is a mosaic dated back to the beginning of the 12th century AD, so uh, during the Middle Age. And uh, uh, if we look at the external part of the uh, mosaic, where uh, um, is, uh, there are uh, the two cities, again Jerusalem and Bethlehem, the two standing men uh, holding a scroll, an open scroll, those are the uh, prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah on the other side. And on top you see four sitting figures. On the left hand uh, are the two saints, Saint, Saint Lawrence and Saint Paul, while on the right hand is Saint Peter wearing the white beard and Saint Clement. So the church where we are is dedicated to Saint Clement. He was third pope after Peter, so he was one of the earliest popes of uh, Christianity. Uh, pope Clement uh, was pope at the very end of the first century AD and uh, according to tradition he was persecuted under Emperor Domitian and uh, he was exiled far away from Rome. The story continues uh, telling that Clement was sentenced to death in a very unusual way. His body was uh, tight to an anchor and he was uh, thrown into the sea. In fact, it, if you look above your head, right at the center of the ceiling over there, you see there is uh, an oil on canvas on which is depicted the glory of Saint Clement. Uh, is uh, the Pope dressed uh, with purple vestments uh, floating up to the sky and uh, there are angels carrying a big anchor which is uh, the symbol of uh, the martyrdom. So the anchor is uh, repeated obsessively almost everywhere here in this church. The baldacchino, which is the Italian word for uh, canopy, uh, is a structure surrounding the most sacred area of the church, corresponding to the main altar. In particular, the altar of this church is uh, standing on top of the relics, or the supposed relics, of St. Clement, which are buried underneath. And uh, this uh, canopy, um, on, at the very top of it, uh, is an anchor. Again, is the symbol related to St. Clement's martyrdom. Watch your step! Watch your step! Uh, use the handrail! We're on our way down, 60 feet down, to the 2nd century pagan temple of Mithra. Here, in front of you, downstairs, uh, a mm, few steps uh, are leading to uh, an original ancient uh, uh, narrow street uh, which separated two buildings. On the right hand it was a tenement house uh, consisting in four floors. On the other side there was the mint where uh, the coins were minted. So it was a uh, an important public building dated back to the second century AD. We have descended to the ground floor of our Roman house and here in 1911 archaeologists digging this area they found with their big surprise something very unexpected. 
There was a, a temple, a worship place dedicated to an oriental god called the Mitra. So I'm sitting now on the bench which was running around the room facing the entrance of the temple. So this was probably the place where the uh, members of the religious community were uh, sitting before entering the temple. Right at the center of the temple is the altar. Uh, on that altar there is a relief uh, representing Mitra, god son, slaughtering a bull is uh, uh, making an offering. The blood of the bull, according to the myth, was fertilizing the earth, giving life to all the creatures. Aside the altar, there are uh, um, those reclined beds on which were placed mattresses and cushions. The members of the religious community used to lay down on those uh, reclined beds and uh, they were sharing a sort of communion consisting in uh, loaf of bread and uh, wine, as well as the early Christian people. There are many links between this oriental cult and the Christian religion. Um, we know very little about uh, the uh, Mitras cult because it was a secret cult. So all the members were uh, keeping the secret about ceremonies and rites. But there is a curiosity. If you look at, up to the ceiling of this temple, you may see there are uh, open holes. There are four squared holes and seven circular holes corresponding to the four seasons of the year and the seven days of the week. So um, it's a mi very meaningful way to represent the cycle of the year. Uh, probably one of the main activity concerned, concerning this, uh, um, uh, this um, uh, culture was uh, watching the stars and predicting the future through the, uh, um, the planets and the constellation. Once uh, the light, the sunlight was coming through the holes, so it was uh, also a very impressive way to enlighten this uh, temple here. Up we go to the excavated remains of the 4th century church which was destroyed by fire in 1084. But instead of restoring it, they built a new church of St. Clement over it. When it was finally excavated, surprisingly, they found a few frescoes in pretty fair condition. In front of us, there is a, a fresco dated back to the, the end of the 11th century AD, depicting the story of St. Alexius. Um, St. Alexius was uh, the son of a Roman senator. He converted into Christian religion, so he uh, moved away from Rome and he stayed in the desert, living as a hermit for 17 years. Then uh, he came back to the city and uh, when he met his father, uh, the father didn't recognize his son. But he offered um, a simple room in his palace where St. Alexius um, lived for the rest of his life. My fascination with San Clemente is because it represents the chaotic history of Italy and Rome especially. And while doing so, it is also the repository of centuries of archaeology, architecture and art. This is the scene of the Piazza of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the facade of the church by the same name. Before we go in, however, I think a little history lesson to put it in perspective would be appropriate. By classical definition, the Renaissance of 1540 to 1600 was almost over by the time St. Ignatius of Loyola was converted to Catholicism in 1521 as he was recovering from his soldiering war wounds. It was a time of chaos. Henry VIII was about to nationalize the monasteries starting in 1534. Luther was about to nail his theses to the Wittenberg Castle Church in 1527. 
Erasmus was arguing with Luther over the free will versus the enslaved will. Meanwhile, the big mech Michelangelo started sculpting the Medici tombs in 1520. The Reformation was in full swing. Kingdoms, principalities, and dukedoms were warring against one another, each territory changing their faiths as often as we change our underwear. Rome was in a state of theological siege. In 1540, the Jays were formed as a missionary group. Soldiers for Christ. A counter-reformation had begun. St. Ignatius died in 1556 and was canonized in 1622. The church was opened in 1650. Its vast open design was quite deliberate. After all, it was the chapel of the Roman college, the Jesuit college. So great lectures, conferences, theological expositions, and student doctrinal theses defended there. Even today, concerts and public ceremonies are held here. Eventually, money ran out to put a dome over the high altar. The church remained undecorated and undomed. Then, in 1684, a young Jesuit painter and mathematician, Brother Andrea Poggio, was hired. He painted this famous trompe d'oeil of a dome over the high altar. Meanwhile, his students were at the same time painting an equally famous ceiling on the nave. Andrea Poggio was a master of perspective, having written a world-famous book on the subject, and was not averse from optical trickery to make his point. The painting on the nave is the triumph of the Counter-Reformation. The big deal here is that there is a red circle in the middle of the nave where all is in perspective. If you move, the angels and Catholics are taken up into the light, while the heretical Protestants are shoved and prodded with archangel spears down into hell. And so they should be, according to the limiting beliefs of the day. Pojo wasn't finished. What's this piece of cloth hanging over the edge of the painting? And the hand of the man out in space? They were both added to create a three-dimensional effect. Remember, this was in 1684. Before visiting the church you just saw, I stopped off to see St. Ignatius's very simple living quarters. Here he worked and slept, while right next door was his private chapel where he said Mass. Just outside these rooms is a corridor, again done by Pojo. Look at it. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. Here I videoed and you really get his genius for perspective as I move along the corridor. My shadow unfortunately gets in the way a bit, but it couldn't be helped. I can only urge you to see all of this for yourselves. The Chaos of Roma in 64 AD. Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Yeah, two-thirds of the then Roma fried to a crisp. He did it to build the most ostentatiously large palace in the world. Move over, Saddam Hussein. The Domo Soraya, Nero's golden house. Look at these plans. The palace and grounds occupied 200 acres. It covered a third of the then known Roma with villas, pavilions, and open porticos. At its center were forests, an altar in a sacred grove, pastures with flocks and vineyards. Rus in urbe. For you Episcopalians, I again will translate. The countryside in the city was a manicured, man-made lake. Nero's ego was colossal. He had a 37-meter, a 121-foot bronze statue of himself planted outside the main palace entrance. This 
Colossus was revamped with the heads of several succeeding emperors till Emperor Hadrian moved it to the Flavian Amphitheater. The building took on its name in the Middle Ages after the nearby statue. To this day, it's, of course, the Colosseum. Nero committed suicide in 68 AD. The excess that this structure expressed was an embarrassment to the Flavian family, his successors. Within 10 years, the marble facing of the brick two-story structure was stripped away together with the embedded jewels and ivory. Soon after Nero's death, the palace and grounds were covered over with dirt. By 79, the Titus Baths were being built over it, followed shortly by the Baths of Trajan and the temples of Venus and Roma. Emperor Vespasian, a Flavian of course, built the Flavian Amphitheater on the site of the palace grounds with the statue of Colossus Neronis beside it. Uncannily, this preserved the frescoes and the grotesques from the Roman humidity, the destructive damn damp. A young Roman fell through a cleft in the Aventine hillside at the end of the 15th century. He found himself in what he thought was a grotto of brightly painted figures, frescoes of course. Now with the damp they're mostly faded to gray. Among the artists who were let down on ropes and scratched their names on what is now the ceiling were Pinturicchio, Raphael, and the Big Mick. You can still see these names together with Dominico Ghirlandaio, Martin van der Hemskrek, Casanova, and the Marquis de Sade. They'd fallen through the roof of the ground floor. First floor to you Americans. I mean, the only reason why it was built in, with those high ceilings is because it was the house of an emperor and the large rooms were emphasizing the importance of the emperor living here. And how, how high are they? So this is about 30 meters high. So, which is uh, um, 90, um, almost 90 feet. This fun palace, or palace of unmitigated debauchery, was a well thought out, highly complex building. This was one of the passageways for servants and soldiers, constructed so they wouldn't have to enter the debauchery. Interestingly enough, there were no bedrooms or lavatories. That must have made debauching very interesting. From here, we'll visit other enormous rooms, some with very faded mosaics. Oh, while if you look above on the ceiling, you see there is a decoration made with uh, pumice stone. This is a very light volcanic stone, which is imitating, imitating a grotto. At the center of this uh, uh, vault, is, uh, there was a mosaic made with uh, glass paste. It's showing two figures. One is a giant and the other in front of him is a man offering a bowl of wine. So the, uh, the episode is taken of uh, the Odyssey, the uh, book written by Homer about uh, uh, Ulysses and it is concerning uh, the episode of the Cyclops and Ulysses offering the bowl of wine to this uh, cyclop, the only one eye uh, cyclop. Um, in this house there are many subjects uh, going back to uh, the poems written by Homer. They were very popular at the time. Have you noticed the palace is made of brick, not marble? It was only based in marble. Nero was a great art collector, and the bowl you see in front of you is one of the few artifacts found in the Domus Aurea. It is made of white marble with handles of twisted snakes. All the other artifacts are in the Vatican Museum. What a banquet room! It's octagonal. The oculus or opening in the ceiling was the forerunner to that 
that you can see in the Pantheon. Both were built out of concrete. The Pantheon was built some years later by Emperor Hadrian in the year 118. Around the dome was a representation of the sky, a sort of planetarium, which according to some moved by hydraulics. No one knows how though. The palace was fabulously decorated. The floors, the walls, the ceilings covered with mosaics, jewels, ivory, etc. Why did I use the word fabulous? Because the artist who did this was called fabulous, though not spelled the same way. It was spelled F-A-B-U-L-L-U-S. Fabulous's effect on the Renaissance was almost immediate and striking. Those of you who saw my previous DVD, where I showed Raphael's Loggia in the Vatican, will remember the walls and ceilings covered with frescoes. And as you can see, the Vatican Museum uses the same coffered decorated ceilings that changed the artist's name into a ubiquitous superlative adjective. It can be said without fear of contradiction that the Renaissance motto of decoration was, to paraphrase a military expression, if it moves, salute it, if it doesn't, paint it, to, if it moves, bless it, if it doesn't, 